Okay, today I want to talk about uh, what I described in the first video, uh, configuration and environment. Uh, this is the part of NFX framework, um, uh, the very important part because everything is based on it. Um, we do not use any Microsoft configuration classes and never uh, uh, you know, reference any of the Microsoft, uh, you know, web config or any other files or any other classes in uh, Microsoft configuration library. Uh, if you ever can uh, count how many classes Microsoft has in their configuration framework, I think it's like hundred classes, if not more. And yet, uh, the the framework is extremely inflexible. Uh, whereas our framework is very flexible and it is uh, around 18 or 17 classes I believe at the moment. You see everything right here. So uh, when I say the Microsoft is not flexible, uh, let me just give you a few examples so you understand that, that I know what I'm talking about here. Um, I want to use variables in configurations. I can't really do it in Microsoft Paradigm. I want to install global uh, resolution hooks for, for global variables in configuration. I cannot do that. Uh, I want to keep my configuration in, in a database or some kind of centralized repository. In Microsoft Paradigm, you cannot do that, easily at least. You can do some custom section and load it from somewhere else, but that's a lot of work. Let me uh, show you what we've done what we have in the NFX framework and I think that would shed some light and uh, answer uh, would answer the questions that uh, you would naturally have. Um, so like I said we do not use any of the Microsoft configuration in, in the unit stack in the NFX framework. Um, Let's start by looking at the general principles here. So first I define an interface called configurable that can configure whoever implements it from iConfig section node, okay, which is right here and we're going to talk about it in a second. Configuration persistent just tells me that this, uh, uh, you know, class, implementing class can uh, persist its state into, con in, into configuration section node, okay, at runtime. The config node um, is the is the general uh, ancestor, so to speak. So it has uh, you know a notion of existence. This is very important because when you navigate the configuration tree, what happens uh, is that if you don't have a node with such a name, you're going to get a special kind of Sentinel node that doesn't exist. Instead of polluting your code with 25,000 statements, if this is not null or this is null, oh my God, this is so hard to do. Um, we never do it. We, when we navigate the path, and there is this path does not exist in the configuration tree, we would still return you nodes that don't exist, but the instances are there. You are not gonna get a reference null reference exception. Uh, verb verbatim value gives you the value of the node without any variables evaluated. Evaluated value will give you the the uh, evaluated value, and. Uh, value actually going to give you evaluated value uh, with all variables evaluated. Um, there is a difference between the value and evaluated value because uh, this this can be set and got, whereas this can only be read. Now this interface is for read-only access. That's why you don't see the setter on evaluated value on on the value. I'm sorry. Uh, so whoever gets those interfaces, they can only read configuration. They cannot modify the configuration content. You have a parent node, and then this is where the marvel comes into play. This is the marvel of our configuration. You have all of the value accessors uh, for different types and there are nullable counterparts if you look like short, short nullable, unsigned short, and uh, you know unsigned short nullable. And then every value accessor has a verbatim uh, you know um, version of it. So if it's verbatim then it's going to give you just a string. It will read it as a string from the node whereas if it is false it will evaluate the variables and we're going to see how it works in, in a second here. Uh, value 
value is type, you pass it a type and it will try to convert the value to the object of that type. Uh, and then some very handy methods for navigation and comparison. Uh, you know, uh, config section node uh, represents the section of the configuration. It has children and it has attributes. Okay, so any node in configuration has those accessors that the, because this is I config node, and then I config section node is a super uh, kind of config section node or sub sub subtype of the config node rather and it has children it has attributes those are all nodes as well config attribute nodes config section nodes and then you have different ways of, of uh, uh, navigating this stuff either by index or by name uh, you have attribute by name attribute by index you have a navigate uh, API that is somewhat similar to XPath uh, where you can navigate the tree with path like syntax and use the dollar signs for an attribute name you know uh, uh, period period for going one step uh, you know, up in the um, path hierarchy. Uh, if path starts from an exclamation, then exception will be thrown if such node does not exist. So you can say that this this path here, it has to exist. Or if you do not put it here, then the navigate will return you a sentinel. Non-existing node of such node does not exist. Uh, navigate section specifically navigates to a section node. Evaluate variables would evaluate the variables in the string that you path to it. So you pass a string that has some some uh, um, you know meaning, like you reference a variable like this, and then you can use a special kind of um, uh, you know uh, path or rather variable concatenation logic with this character, which is important when you manipulate the computer hard drive paths. Uh, when you try to uh, construct a, a hard drive or disk path uh, from multiple variables, uh, this is where this operator comes in handy. Uh, if a variable name is prefixed with this, uh, you know, snake-looking tilde, whatever it's called, character, then what that means is this is an external variable. So, for example, here, here is a good example. So, let's say I have a, a an attribute called value, and I set it to my to the to the uh, value of my home variable my external variable called home and then depending whether it has a forward slash or not it will do the proper combination of those two path passes uh, you know uh, if this has a, a path at, uh, slash at the end it will not add it if it, it doesn't have it it will add it so it will join those two values as, as it will treat it as a uh, navigable disk path on the drive uh, okay, so I think that explains what it does. So, uh, and that's 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 pretty much it. And this is some advanced stuff that we don't really want to go into at this point. But that's it. So, uh, what are what are configuration files, or where do we take the configuration? It doesn't have to come from the file. It comes from the string or content of any sort, and uh, it can even come from command line arguments, for example, because the configuration is the, is a tree in the uh, memory and it can come from different sources and different syntaxes. So here is an example of command args configuration that takes famous string array as an input and it would parse it into a configuration tree that would uh, you know parse all of those intricacies into into a hierarchical structure that you can then uh, work with in the code like this. Okay now the most interesting thing about it is that unifies how you configure things. Okay, uh, let's look at the um, let's look at the different classes here. So we have a uh, an XML configuration. This is the class that loads configuration from uh, XML file and saves it to XML file. We have a laconic configuration 
which is our preferred, sta um, you know, um, what do you call it, standard or file format, which is much better than XML. It's much easier to work with, has less junk in it, and it's just it's just better. And uh, it has one line comments. It has things like verbatim strings and and uh, Unicode escapes and stuff like that. So here is just an example of what a laconic format looks like with some variables in it. But it is just one of the configuration implementation, another one being XML and, uh, uh, like I said, command args configuration. Um, so let's start by looking at some practical. I think it's, it's okay right here. So this class here uh, is a logger sync, or what we call them destination in uh, NFX. And this one is an SMTP destination. That means that it sends a simple mail transfer protocol. It sends an email. Okay. It sends log messages as emails. Okay. And. Uh, it has a bunch of stuff here, a bunch of parameters that need to get configured. And uh, now, uh, bear in mind that unlike Microsoft configuration where you create a special type just for a section, which is inconvenient, a lot of times you just need to configure the stuff that you already have. Why would you create some junk class just for configuration purposes? You don't want it. You don't need it. You don't want to pollute your code. So how you do it here, you just, cr this is your class, these are your properties, of your this is this is actual class what I'm saying like the class that does something useful okay not just the data transfer object for configuration not some real class so what we do here we configure those guys right here we just set the config attribute right here okay so the framework is going to detect it and it will of course understand the type of this variable and the type in your configuration file and it will try to um, convert the types like enumerated uh, types and stuff like that uh, so if that was an enumerated type it would have interpreted what you have in the text file as a part of the enumeration and if it's not possible then it will return default you can specify the default right here default and then you can also specify a path to your configuration parameter so like like you know I showed you before you can navigate right so you can navigate right here like this okay rather like this okay you can so instead of being called credentials hyphen ID what it does it takes that name and it detects the change a case change uh, like a Pascal uh, case naming uh, and every time the casing is changing it will insert a hyphen and it will be lowercase so basically this is the same as if I wrote here credentials hyphen ID now that would entail that this is an attribute, not a section, an attribute. It doesn't have any children, okay? So, but I don't need to write it because by default it will do all of the magic stuff for me. Just like that, okay? And I can specify a different default value as well. So, how is the how is this stuff going to get bound to the actual properties? So, that is going to be done in the destination class that calls the method apply, configuration attribute apply to this instance. Just one line of code, and it will do everything for you, okay? So, there is nothing much here. What it does, it creates a mail message and sends a message, a logger, uh, you know, entry message into an email and sends it okay it's a very simple class doesn't do any rocket science here let's not save any changes all right so um, let's look at some other class let's look at the rule I think okay I ha have it right here this guy is dealing with uh, firewall rules uh, I explained before we have a software firewall that uh, yeah I'll be, okay one sec okay uh, yes that we can um, used to detect denial of service attacks and stuff uh, this has this guy has tons of properties here now if you look here I can configure it right here I can apply my um, configuration to my fields not only properties my fields and what this guy will, will do it will uh, chop off this prefix here so the name of this parameter config file is going to be name order action okay and here is a good example remember I talked about a num type so I think gate action is in a num type yeah deny and allow okay so that's what gate does the deny allow access okay so my my default action is deny 
and I could have skipped it but I decided to include it here so it's just the code is more clear in its intent so um, yeah that's that's what it's gonna do and uh, even if no one calls this uh, it will still that's why I put deny here just for the clarity but how it's gonna get applied configuration attribute which is this guy right here apply this node see the node is config section node that you pass in here and it gets applied and then there are many other properties here that have satters so when I apply the string to this method the satter is gonna get called well, of course because it's a property satter and of course it uses reflection to do all of that stuff there is no rocket science here but it's just done in a very elegant and very pleasant and usable way okay uh, now let's look at this tool here called glue compiler it's a command line tool I think I showed it uh, to some of you last time uh, if we uh, if we run it from command line it's a pretty complex tool in terms of like what the command line options that it parses well guess what would it take you to parse all of, all of those things and 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 use them in the code now uh, if we look at the NFX here, what it does, the first thing it does, so this is the main method string arcs, it's a console app, right? String arcs, okay, fine. So we pass it to the method run, which is like a kernel core method of this whole program. Uh, config, because run is surrounded by try catch and I get some error to the console, that's what I do. That's why I put it in the run method. So I allocate the configuration, command arc configuration from those arcs. And now I can do things like this. So check this out. Config root question mark H or help. If that exists, then I write the markup context and I get my markup context. That's another helper method, which is very, very convenient. Um, if we go to tools, uh, where is it? Uh, glue, glue compiler. So I have my help with the syntax highlighting right here. You see what I'm saying? And it is embedded as a resource, so I just get a C type of program, get text. This this is just used to collocate resource in the assembly manifest. It's just a helper method, that's it. So it gets this file and write markup context, content, well, uh, get that script from here with all of the color coding and interpret it nicely, okay? Again, one of the things that NFX gives you for free, I don't know why Microsoft never built anything like this. It's such a pain in the butt to, to, to write a good looking, you know, tools with with different formatting and it's always a you know a pain but so with a configuration you see I can work with a configuration now interesting thing here is that this guy activates something called glue compiler which is a generic or not generic like abstract class rather and it has some some parameters that I can configure so instead of writing this by hand can you imagine what a pain in the butt that would be to write all of that so I just write some well here right here configuration attribute apply compiler config root o opt or options so this is going to call us those three if, if there is an o switch it will use that if not then opt if not that then options okay so because this is config section node and it has a root you know and the root has an indexer that takes those guys in there and it will just call us them and apply them to the compiler if none of this exists you are not going to get a null reference exception the node does not exist namespace filter is very simple you take either f filt or filter and you get the first attribute that you have at the first in if this attribute does not exist this method is not going to crash it's going to return you a no an attribute node that has its existing property set to true uh, to false okay this node does not exist so I think you understand how easy it gets when you work with configuration and command line and and once again, I can configure the tool if I want to from Laconic or XML or from command line because it doesn't really matter what this configuration attribute, it works with the tree in memory, not with some text file. So uh, we talked about this, we talked about this tool that, uh, another thing here is that you see how this, this guys are called pretty lengthy names for the purposes of clarity and just you know readability in the code now I don't want to specify such a long name in my in my command line tool so I, I overrode them so file per contract is FPC out is out and again I can coalesce multiple 
attributes here using either comma or um, what do you call it or or the pipe character okay so the framework would understand it now we talked about the uh, let's look at the some of the unit tests uh, because unit tests are always a good um, testing and unit okay it's already expanded so let's look at the provider loads first this this is a very simple test case I have two identical uh, configuration files written in different syntaxes configuration trees I'm sorry or content contents string contents uh, written in two different syntaxes one XML one in laconic and they do the same thing and you can load them here and both of them resolve this to USA config root navigate behavior behavior type root behavior behavior behaviors behavior type and it's gonna return you this string and uh, in uh, uh, laconic you can either use single quotes or double quotes and if you start just like in JavaScript you start a single quote you need to escape a single and you can use double quotes inside and vice versa okay so that shows you this uh, let's look at the uh, um, value accessors this is very cool um, I have a configuration script here where I have created attributes call them V and then different uh, types and uh, as you can see and I use laconic here because it's easier so I have a string here that spans multiple lines if you're familiar with verbatim or uh, yeah verbatim strings in C sharp you use this dollar sign here and it tells me that this string is a verbatim string and it can understand any kind of string can understand Unicode escape sequences multi-line or single line comments just like in C programming language they're all supported in this format and then you can have integers, double decimal, hexadecimal, uh, you know, that are readable as integer, of course. And then you can even have buffers, binary buffers, goods of different kinds. So let's let's look at the uh, hexadecimal integer. See, I have a b a b a b a b, and I read it as value as u short as u long. Uh, as different uh, as different integers and it reads all of that stuff for me uh, here's my here's my um, verbatim string oh uh, check out how I load that um, content here this is the string this is an extension method for a string as laconic config and then I can do throw if I have a syntax error here it will throw an error by default it will return null if it convert it cannot convert it we're going to talk about object conversions in NFX some other time but this is very very useful and very important um, you know mechanism uh, and um, like I said you can also read some um, byte arrays right here you know I can read a byte array which is again very handy if you want to store like a cipher fingerprint or something in your config file you have all of that stuff in here okay and uh, another thing that you can do you can read this variable as boolean it will return true because this is not zero so it does indirect conversions as well and this is very uh, very useful because if you have a property called enabled in your config someone writes true someone writes yes it will be the same thing someone writes one it will be the same thing someone writes uh, you know uh, some other string it will be interpreted as false because only I think yes uh, true uh, truth uh, or affirmative I think I interpret just like five or six English keywords as being true okay uh, everything else is, is interpreted as false but what I was trying to say that I uh, allow you to read 
uh, a date time value or an integer value as date time value and as time span and all of that stuff it's all been built in here and you may say oh this is very insecure it is very secure and I've been using this actually not myself but even with with all of the developers uh, we have been using this for a few years and um, before NFX formed as a big project we used some parts of this even before and this is so useful uh, that I can't even tell you you have to try to understand how useful this is okay and um, so we talked about uh, um, value accessors now let's talk about um, variable evaluation with a variable evaluation you can do a lot of things uh, what happens is imagine you have a uh, path on the disk where you uh, have to write some output and usually what happens in the Microsoft config files you have 25 places where you have the same path and then you need to change C colon backslash this to D colon backslash that it's a pain in the butt you need to change the 25 places here you just put it in one variable and then you reference your variable like this so the variable to and I'm using XML syntax here you see it's the same thing if it's laconic or XML the same concept if your value starts or has this pattern here this is considered to be a path of the variable inside the config tree so we're on this level if we have two uh, periods here we go one level up and we go to var1 okay so what is going to, going to be the value of var2 it's going to be val1 once again this will replace this with this because this points to this okay and then uh, an interesting um, an interesting uh, observation um, if you ever written anything like this yourself before you would probably say what's going to happen with recursive vars look here var3 uses var4 and var4 uses var3 of course this is going to be detected and you're going to get an exception a runtime exception when you try to either read var4 or var3 and this this is all thread safe by the way this is important because this is used in the server programming um, many times but what happens uh, here is that um, you can navigate you can put those complicated path and let's say this path does not exist so so what is it what is this going to evaluate to nothing empty string okay you're not going to get an error unless you put an exclamation sign here that will require that path. If that doesn't find it, see, this is what I'm talking about. If this doesn't find it, you're going to get a runtime exception. When you try to read the require, the value of the required, um, you know, uh, variable or uh, not the variable, but the section, the section which is, I believe, off the root. See the root? It's it's under it. You're going to get an exception if it doesn't exist. And here we have some variables where we. Um, get some variables uh, concatenate some variables together and here we say that this variable should be treated as a disk path so if this doesn't end with the uh, trailing slash uh, then it, it would add one if it does it would not it will do some path arithmetic what I call it okay and of course we have uh, you know uh, we have uh, unit tests here that cover different use cases here um, and recursive vars, external variables, uh, environment variable resolver uh, is, a, is an interesting class. You just implement this interface and by default the environment variable resolver is going to be your operating system variable resolver that just gets your environment variables from Windows box or a Linux box. Okay but let's say you want to use some environment uh, variables uh, in uh, uh, some other context you can do that so here is the dummy resolver that uh, understands ABC and returns those particular values 
you see what I'm driving at here. So, and there is one called VARS that is basically an extension of the dictionary. So you can, it's called VARS. Uh, it is the dictionary that implements iEnvironment uh, Variable Resolver. So if you need to throw in some values in your config file, that's how you do it. Uh, how do you set it? I think the configuration has an injectable property that allow you to uh, inject it in. And let me show you how cool this is. Let me switch to a different project for a second here. Um, let me close this. So, this is uh, this is whole different project, different framework called OM Cluster for cluster programming. But what we have here, we are defining some services in the configuration space. This is a laconic configuration format, and we want to define some attributes. But I I don't really want to repeat those values because I have them in C sharp. I have them in my code. How do I get them from the code? in my config file, easy. All I have to do is implement a simple variable resolver that detects if my variable uh, name starts from this prefix, then it will read it at runtime from my file. And uh, I believe the ARM cluster, uh, here are my primary constants in my ARM cluster project. There are some services and some ports, some primary application names and everything. And then I have a very resolver here called system var resolver that basically binds it pro process wide you see the configuration class has a special global hook called process wide environment var resolver and it just a singleton class that that sets the instance to it because this is a singleton class and what does it do and it sees if the name of the variable starts with a prefix and the prefix being sysconsts dot then it would try to get a field right from this class and and resolve it so if I say sysconst default BDB web port, it will return 8084. You see how cool this is? And then if it doesn't find it here, then it re reverts back to Windows Environment Variable Resolver, which is three lines of code. It uses environment get environment variable by name. But it implements the same interface, so it is injectable in the configuration. Okay, so I think you get the idea what I was trying to say, all right? So like I said, so now in my configuration tree, in my configuration sections I can use I can use those different variable values that are synchronized with my runtime code and I need to have them in code for some other reason that's why syscons have them in code to begin with but I can clone it so to speak into my configuration without having to repeat it by hand okay uh, now let's talk about macro evaluation. A macro is a function that you can use. Here is an example. Um, this is very cool. Look at this extension method. This is actually a configuration framework, but <laughs> the way it's built, you can use it just on a string like this. Uh, this is really cool. Um, you can write a string where you can put a variable, put a variable in here, and then um, you put the value of the variable here, but this variable doesn't have any value because now it doesn't take any argument. It returns and it returns the current date and time, and, and, and it takes a few parameters. Those are parameters, named parameters of this function, of this macro. And if I evaluate it, I get my, um, uh, what do you call it, date and time formatted like this. Okay, and this is actually, this parameter is actually for testing. So the now, instead of taking real time, it will take the time that you give it here. Okay, but uh, to put it in the practical context, what is it used for? Imagine a logger and you need to set the, the name of the log file that would depend on, on the timer or something. That's what you use macros for. Uh, uh, Mark Spencer, the value is 12. Okay, so how does it know? Look. Uh, tilde name and then I inject this vars class that I talked about which implements I variable resolver here and it says that name equals to Mark Spencer and I get this name as string that's a typecast operator I could have, could have gotten it as an integer and would have received zero because you cannot convert Mark Spencer to, to an integer but I could do other things I could convert an integer to date and time or integer to boolean and 
stuff like that. So I can do some interesting things here with typecast operator that looks like as hyphen and then the type that you want to convert it into. And of course, sh those should be only primitive or well recognized system types. Okay. Uh, I mean, like, um, you know, GUID and uh, byte buffer, something like this. But then uh, the default uh, name is um, James. So had this not been here, I would have seen James instead of because it can find it. That's why I see Mark Spencer. Okay, the value is don't exist as in blah 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 blah. So if I evaluate all of this, evaluates to default 12 because don't exist. There is no such variable in this configuration tree. Now this is a very simple, this is a one-liner with evaluate vars. But what you can do uh, uh, you can use this this arithmetic with long uh, in the configuration files and then you can do a lot of uh, evaluate vars and XML config scope. So this will say hello one two three Zuzlik or whatever. So what it means is that this is going to read the var value of v and v equals to one two three. So it will evaluate this in the scope of this. There are a lot of things here, a lot of flexible things here that you can just uh, you know utilize and. Uh, um, what we want to look at here is, I think, in the serialization slim, we can uh, the the configuration is serializable. Okay, so you can serialize th this configuration. So I get this configuration, not string, but string as configuration, then save configuration. An interesting thing is here, I can inject an environment resolver here that, uh, you know, resolves those names into, into those values. Okay, and then... Um, here I have my macro runner that has one function called Jabify, and it just input, uh, you know, takes your input value and adds the string to the end of it. Okay, so if I get the flag as bool, wait, where is it? Uh, oh, it's one down. It's right here. Dear member, we have Jabified you into member Jabify. So here is the function name. And Jabify means in Russian, it means to make someone look like a toad, you know, like a frog. <laughs> <laughs> so what this does, D dear Zytro, we have Jabified you into Zytro Jabenko. <laughs> So having some fun here, but this is pretty cool. You got the gist of what I'm trying to show here. Um, so uh, yeah, we talked about macro evaluation. Uh, let's talk about includes. Um, now you see how many features we have in this thing. So um, and unit uh, includes. So what include allows you to do, it allows you to do what a C compiler does. Instead of that include pragma, it replaces the whole pragma with the content of that included file. So, and how you do it, you can call it on the configuration node, you include some other node. So it says completely, let's look at it here, completely replaces this node with another node tree positioning the new tree in the place of local node. Existing node is deleted after operation completes in its place, node for other node inserted, preserving. So you see how cool this is? So this is used like, you can do scripts, I'll show you in a second how you do it, uh, you know, in the configuration files and you can include different files from different places with the include pragma. Okay, pragma, pragma, whatever you call it. Overrides and merges, uh, that's an interesting uh, feature as well. A very important feature for real-time configuration, um, you know, cases. What you can do, you can structurally merge configuration documents in memory. You know, like Microsoft allows you to do a hierarchy of config files and different folders. You can do the same thing with our framework, only this is way more, um, you know, pliable, more uh, malleable, uh, you know, adaptable to your particular 
particular case. Um, what you can do, you can set an override rule here, right here. So if you override section B, the override will override only attributes, not the subsections. The override of this section will fail. This cannot be overridden. The override of this section and uh, this cannot be overridden and no exception will be thrown because this will stop. This is a sealed section but without an error. This is a sealed section with an error because it will fail. And this is a um, uh, this will replace this section completely and this will only replace sections but not the attributes. Okay. Now what's interesting is that you can have one document in XML, another in Laconic, and the third one is a command line args. And if you want to buy a configuration that uses JSON format, but believe me, I'm sure you will never do it because Laconic format is way more flexible than JSON. Okay, it's just better format. It has many features that JSON doesn't have. That's why I didn't I wanted to build a JSON configuration, but then I just decided not to because it's just it's just a waste of time. I'm never gonna use it and no one will ever use it it's just not 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 um not necessary. You have the laconic configuration is sim, sim, you know, similar to JSON, but it's just way better because you have, um, you know, different kind of comments and escapes here and different features that JSON doesn't doesn't have. But. Uh, um, what happens here is that you can do merge, like you can create configuration from merge of two other configurations, okay? You can you have a memory configuration as well, this is just a configuration buffer in memory that you cannot save anywhere, but you can put it, you can clone it into XML or into Laconic and save it like that, you can do that if you want to expect so those are different unit tests that do some crazy you know uh, structural document comparisons here so this is important why because um, in real applications you want to override configuration with different folder level or a different hierarchy level in your database or from anywhere you load your configuration from uh, scripting how about that? Now with scripting you can write imperative scripts. Imperative stands for scripts that can execute like code. And the way you do it, and you may ask me why do you need to write scripts? And I'll show you some real world uh, cases for it. Uh, you write the script with some script uh, commands that are basically loop, call, that calls a subroutine, uh, and then uh, some fragments like like uh, if statement and set and if this is an if statement and you can change all of those grammar rules you can specify in your configuration how you want to call this so-called keywords the if statement looks like this if and then you have a path and then you have an expression that can have logical conditions and full arithmetic evaluation as well just like you would do in Visual Basic or C Sharp or any other language so what that would do what I'm doing here I'm looping 15 times uh, no I'm looping uh, three times because I started 12 and until I'm less than 15 I'm increasing my variable to, I'm setting my variable to the variable plus one, okay, and then I do section loop, I output this as my output, having my loop variable as the name of the section. Now you may ask me, whoa, well, this is crazy, what do you need it for? Check this out. So I have this tight loop written here, and here, here is the output, 13, 14, 15, you see this? Instead of writing this by hand three times, I have created this. Now you may ask me, why do you need to write so many crappy uh, sections 
because this is what is it copy paste development or something no uh, this is used for something else I'll show it to you in a second but the ability to run uh, macros in the configuration file um, is an important feature especially uh, if if I tell you that it knows how to detect loops uh, you know like cycles in the variable names and everything so this script will never freeze okay and um, the way how you do it, you allocate the script runner which is a part of the same framework configure those 17 classes I told you in the beginning and it has an execute method that takes the configuration as a source and then it takes configuration as the as the target configuration and it populates result from source it executes sorts into result into target okay and then look what I do here I save my result save to string and I dump it to my console all right uh, so and I have different different scripts here and like I said I can even call subroutines here with uh, call syntax see this like a go sub in basic okay so what is it used for um, I'm gonna show you real quick some script for the database here in some real application that has uh, the whole database script is written in the so here my includes in this uh, laconic configuration relations relational schema which is a special tool that we have in NFX that allows you to create database creation scripts based on some logical rules here so I have a schema and I include those files here and what are those files and let's start with this so this is the file where I proclaim some types, some domains, so to speak, and here are some scripts. So for example, here is a script for for person name block. It has first name, middle name, last name. You see how clever this gets. So now instead of repeating those columns in 25 different tables, I just have it in one place here. And then when I have my user when I have my user table where I have my username here, I just call the script. Call scripts person name block. So this will be turned into first name, last name, middle name. So this tool actually would generate the uh, DML uh, or DDL, data definition SQL script for you, resolving all of the foreign keys and everything. And then you just target it. Well, let me show you how it works. I just call this tool and we're done. What we have created, we have created MySQL target, uh, which is right here. And it has created this beautifully looking script for me with all constraints and everything for MySQL. You see, R7 is the name of my system, tables MySQL, SQL. Now, if I tell the compiler, this compiler, uh, R schema, if I tell it, if I, um, oops, what the hell? Well, um, oh, 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 what am I saying? RSC, Relational Schema Compiler. If I tell my compiler to uh, output for a different, you see a fully qualified compiler, if emitted, MySQL compiler is used by default. You can uh, specify, let's say, Oracle compiler. You just inject the class here with the switch and it will generate all of the scripts for Oracle, okay, instead. Or Microsoft SQL Server or IBM DB2. This remains the same, the output changes. Okay, this, I don't want to pollute your, uh, you know, uh, consciousness right now with this, um, uh, relational schema tool that we can talk uh, about some other time is just one simple tool in NFX but uh, that gives you a good use case for what uh, configuration scripting is used for okay some people tell me oh it looks like Perl well maybe it does but that's fine um, not in terms of syntax but like conceptually you know um, scripting and let's look at the behaviors a behavior is a form of aspect-oriented programming. What we can do here is uh, create a behavior 
So what I do here is this. First of all, I create a uh, mock logger destination that logs my log messages into this list just for this test. And then I create a, an always log behavior. And from what I recall, behavior is an attribute. It is an attribute. So you can specify it on things, okay, in code, or you can inject it in a config file. And when the behavior gets applied, see what I have here is this. If target is log service, then it will register destina this list destination, okay? regardless of whether I have it in configuration or not. I mean the logger. So if you're familiar with aspect-oriented programming uh, to address some cross-cutting concerns, those are things like logger or some policy injection. So let's say I want to guard all of the all of the access, uh, you know, places where I access my security provider or something. I want to guard it with some, with some um, uh, instrumentation code or, 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 or with, with some logging code okay I want to log something I can put this behavior here I can specify what I want to do and then I can inject it in the configuration so here I have a configuration file here that has a log service but it doesn't have any configuration the configuration for the logger there are no destinations here but I put the behaviors on the logger and then what happens here is that the moment I start my application container, the behavior is going to get applied. See, I say app log write hello or hello, whatever. Uh, and uh, what happens is that that in my log service uh, list destination, I have my message. Although I didn't configure my log service, with the destination, the behavior did it uh, for me. Then what I can do, I can now apply the behavior not to the log service, but to the application container. You see, it's not under the log, but it's the way, uh, you know, the one level above it. So, it's still applied here because it cascades down the tree. And I still gonna see there is no configuration for the logger. This logger, had this not been here, had this not been here, or this had this not been here, I would have not seen anything in my log output because the logger is not configured. And then um, here I apply the behavior on the application level, but I ask it not to cascade. Cascade false. You see, cascade true and cascade false. And then my third test case, if I write anything uh, to the logger, I'm going to get an, an error message when I try to set up my application container right here. No log destination registered. This is just a, an exception. Why? Because in this config file, I have a logger. I promulgated here. I said in the config file that there is a logger, but I didn't put any. Now, had I not put this in here, I would have received a NOP, no operation logger, and I wouldn't have received, would have not received this error. But because I did put the logger, I say there is a logger, but I didn't say what destinations I have. I received an error because this behavior did not cascade down. However, in this case above, it did cascade down, and that's why I did not see the error. Okay? So that's why I see hello, hello here. And here I see an error message. I cannot start the application container because it's not configured properly. Okay? So this is a little bit tricky, but it's not tricky. It's very useful. This is an aspect oriented programming feature. Now, and in conclusion, I want to say that. Uh, as, as I make more videos about the Unistack, it is going to become apparent that the concept of unified stack of software becomes more and more prominent the more software you build around the same concept, the more compression, intellectual property, so to speak, compression you get. Because imagine what 
the, just the stuff that I showed to you today, what it would have uh, uh, taken uh, someone to build from scratch, and then the worst part of it is not building it from scratch. The worst part of it is that when you write an application, you configure the same things, different things in your application the same way, then it all depends on the same module. But if you have different components that you configure differently, that's when you start having a lot of mess. So that's why we do not use nlog for logging and log for NAT in the same process. We do not use different third parties. We use Unistack. Unistack is one stack of software that allows you to save on Unity that you use, not Microsoft Unity, but conceptual Unity. Okay, so and this whole source code is right here in NFX. You can feel free to uh, you know open it up and, and see how it works. And it is a very very small code base. Let's look at the script runner that runs the scripts. It is only 370 lines of code. Okay. Not much code here, but many features. So to give you a recap, um, I have a little list here that I did before making this video. Uh, we have around 17 classes that does all of this. We have configuration format, XML, laconic, and command line arg parser that parse in a unified tree. All of that gets parsed into the tree in memory. That tree can be serialized and moved between processes and nodes. Um, you can do a lot of stuff uh, with applying attributes either by code imperatively or declaratively with config attribute. They will get automatically applied for you. You can do provider polymorphic loads from different file formats. You can do different value accessors uh, that would allow you to uh, work with um, uh, with different with different types, even things like GUIDs uh, in different formats with hyphens, not hyphens, with uh, byte buffers and uh, binary. Uh, you know, you can uh, you can read binary data as well. That's pretty cool, I think. Uh, you can read hexadecimal data r right here from you know different different formats. You can transform types. You can do uh, variable evaluation. You can put variables, external variables, either in your computer or in your process, and you do it just by doing this syntax with the snake looking tilde and uh, dollar sign and parenthesis takes the path to your variable. If it starts from tilde that's an environmental variable uh, or you can have a path to another variable reference variable in the same configuration now in um, uh, the, this project that I mentioned uh, OM cluster this is taken to the whole new level where you can um, do a lot of things like you can reference constants in your code right in your config file without repeating their values you can also do policy based programming with specifying the types that uh, resolve uh, I mean that satisfy some contracts in the uh, in the application and then you use these variables instead of this types. So in 25 different places I use this variable here. If I want to change in 25 different configurations uh, the class that satisfies this contract for me, I change it in one place here. Now we also talked about macro evaluation that is like being able to um, uh, insert things like uh, you know um, now and date times and different like have some imperative function right in the configuration tree evaluated at runtime. We also talked about um, you know custom variable evaluator and custom uh, macro runners that you can create just by implementing those interfaces and injecting them. You can inject the stuff on the process level in one uh, thread safe uh, instance variable and that would set the uh, resolver for the whole process or for a particular instance of particular configuration class. You can do that. Um, we talked about XML and Laconic. Everything I use is Laconic format. You see it here, right here on, 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 on the computer, on, on my display right now. Um, 
XML is more verbose and laconic allows you to do more interesting escapes and everything you know like string escapes and stuff uh, you can also do um, um, uh, you can also do overrides and merges this is a very important feature so here for example I um, set some general variables and I say override fail that means that no uh, application configuration can override uh, in the root of my configuration tree here in my cluster application I set it to um, this values and I say that I cannot override it on individual application level however I can override other things you know override all but uh, you know general variable section I cannot override it's gonna fail okay and how I use it here so here is a provider for disk object store provider instead of using real type I use the variable reference here GV types volatile file okay GV types volatile file okay uh, overrides and merges scripting I use scripting for things like um, you know compilation of uh, database scripts and stuff very useful and behaviors would allow you to do aspect uh, oriented kind of programming so um, that pretty much concludes what configuration is what it does uh, one last uh, touch uh, here is uh, uh, touch up on this painting of configuration is this factory utils this has some helper methods for making configure you give it a config section node and it will make and configure an instance of the class this is very useful for type uh, for instance uh, injection like dependency injection container and it is only less than 200 lines of code and what it does you can make using constructor you can make using um, configuration node and it just reads the type from here and it tries to typecast and uh, gives you all kinds of exceptions and cross checks and, and whatnot but that's pretty much the whole dependency injection framework that we have in NFX which is less than 200 lines of code okay and uh, no ninjact or uh, Microsoft unity here or anything else and never will be because we have to keep everything extremely simple and functional and that concludes the uh, overview of what NFX does in terms of configuration and we even touched uh, a topic of ARM cluster how it's used there as well and um, thank you for your time and I'll see you some other time and some other video about NFX. Thanks.